Hey folks, my name is John Mayer and I'm the executive director of Cali. Uh, thanks for inviting me to speak and uh, let's just get right into it. So pulling up my PowerPoint, here we go. So Cali is a nonprofit consortium of almost 200, almost all US law schools. And we're involved in lots of things and I'm gonna to briefly touch on that. But my talk today is about uh, our work in access to justice, document automation, um, and I call it legal ed plus legal aid plus legal tech. All right, let's get started. So first of all, go ducks. Oh, sorry, that was your old one. Here, go ducks. <laughs> this is Cali. We're a small operation, a 501c3. We've been around since 1982. So next year is our 40th uh, year, I guess. Um, in internet years, that's like 10 million years or something like that. Um, we've got 11 staff. And uh, we're probably best known, if you're a law student, um, for the Cali Award. Um, if you get the highest grade in your class, at least if you're at uh, one of 130 law schools, uh, you can receive an award for having gotten the highest grade um, such that uh, we, and we've been doing this for 25 years. So it's uh, gotten to the point where if you Cali a class, that means you've gotten the highest grade. Uh, so, so we're a verb now. All right. Um, we're probably also we very well known for our Cali lessons. Hopefully you've run some of our Cali lessons. There's over 1200 of them written by law faculty with the intention to teach you a very specific area of law in an interactive asynchronous online tutorial. All right. Um, we're increasingly getting known for publishing textbooks, casebooks. We pay law faculty to write casebooks and then we give them away for free. I know, great, right? But our goal, although free is wonderful, our goal is to publish the source of the textbook. In other words, we let the students and the faculty download the Microsoft Word file um, so they can make modifications, add commentary or notes, uh, do highlights. Basically, they have the agency to do whatever they want with the, with the teaching material. Um, and the fact that we give it away under a Creative Commons open education license is, uh, is just a bonus. All right, so let's talk about this. Um, Callie, so, what, so if we're all involved in these legal education uh, activities, why are we involved also in access to justice? So hold that thought. Um, I'm going to answer that question, but I'm going to come about, you know, basically use this presentation to come about the why that is so. All right. So before I start, though, I need to explain a little bit about what this problem space is. Um, one of the ways it's described is the access to justice gap. And what that means is that take 10 people and uh, you know, uh, so, so the federal government funds the Legal Services Corporation, which then funds the statewide legal aid organizations. There's 130 or 132 legal aid organizations. Some states have four or five, right? But of the people who are eligible to get legal aid, in other words, they're poor enough, they're below the poverty line or 125% of the poverty line. I'm not exactly clear on that. Um, only 50% of them actually can get help. And that's not, and that's because there aren't enough legal aid attorneys to help all the people who ask for help. So 50% of the people are literally turned away at the door. It's worse than that, right? The real number is closer to 80%. Um, in some places, in some courts, in some vertical law areas, 80% of the people are representing themselves. We call them SRLs, self-representing litigants. Um, and then a lot of times there's an SRL on both sides of the case, all right? So this is a huge problem. There's not enough legal aid and there's an awful lot of people who, for whatever reason, don't trust or don't or can't afford or won't hire lawyers. And the appropriations for LSC have been essentially flat over the last 50 years. There's a nice little bump happening this year, the Biden administration. But, but for the last, you know, since 1979, um, um, the amount of money being spent on legal aid is about the same. Now, it's worse than that, right? Because during that same time, uh, the population went up another 100 million people. 
So you could argue that flat funding for legal aid over 40 or 50 years means that there's been a 30% or a 40% decline in funding for legal aid because there's more people who need uh, assistance, all right? Um, so, so part of the problem is that Americans don't know when they have a legal problem and, and who to seek legal help from. This is an article from uh, Rebecca Sandifer, who's a MacArthur Grant, uh, MacArthur Genius Fellow. Um, and her, her writings on this are excellent. So the, this is the number of people reporting at least one civil justice situation. And as you can see, the low income, the one at the bottom, the low income, you know, it's almost 80% of them. Um, have some sort of legal problem. Now, this is what they do when they have a legal problem. 46% of them self-help. Those are the SRLs I was just talking about. 16%, you see there, do nothing. Maybe if I ignore the problem, it will go away. 16% um, get help from family and friends. Some of them, 15, get help from an advisor or representative. I'm assuming that those are the people who can find either a, a friend or a family who's a lawyer um, or get help from legal aid you know, or and the 7% from both. All right. Here are the reasons why they don't get legal help, right? No need for advice. In other words, I can handle this myself. Now, whether that's true or not is remains to be seen, but it's, but it's, a, it's a little scary that that's the reason why people think I don't need any help. Um, it wouldn't make any difference. The, the second biggest reason. Here's the, here's the odd thing. It's not money. Money's only third on that. In other words, I may not be, I may be willing to spend the money, but I don't think I need it. Or way down there in number three is it costs too much. Um, only down at the bottom there, I don't know where to go or I'm stressed out. I'm anxiety, anxiety ridden about this comes into play as well. And I'll bring, I'll, I'll touch back on that later as well. So notice though that the top two are, there's there's the belief that I don't need advice and it wouldn't make any difference even if I got one. In other words, I'm, I'm in utter despair about, about my legal problem. So it's not always about money. So back in 2000, Legal Services Corporation got money from Congress to do something called the Technology Initiative Grant Program. We call it TIG, TIG for short. We love our TLAs. TLA stands for three letter acronym, right? And Callie was, was, was heavily involved in that, but, but through this path. In 2001, we did a study where we visited courthouses and we followed SRLs on their journey through, through courts. And it was horrific. Um, the number of problems they saw, they got the wrong forms, they got bad advice, they, they, they incorrectly filled out forms, they, they weren't prepared. For, for things before they got in front of the judge. Anyhow, long story short, a, a, a group of law students, a group of design students, and myself uh, you know, watched people deal with the justice system um, at the ground level. And uh, they wrote a book called Access to Justice, Meeting the Needs, um, in which they came up with 200 ways, 200 different solutions to how you could improve the justice system for uh, self-representing litigants. All right. From out of that, Callie took inspiration that one of the big problems was that people fill out forms incorrectly. Now, forms are used everywhere inside of law and inside of the government. And it turns out that completing a form or having the right, you know, knowing that you're on the right form was one, very stressful and two, um, difficult to do for your typical SRL. And so we chose to try to solve this problem make it easier, better possible for people to complete the filling out of court forms. All right, forms are that language. They're, they're, they're a form of a language that the courts use to talk to themselves and to the lawyers about the complexity of the processes. So from the SRL viewpoint, they're just putting information into little, little boxes. From the court's viewpoint, they're going down a decision tree path in which they'll be slotted or decisions will be made based on the information that's, go, that's being entered into the thing, right? This is, this is not some brand new revelation. Um, there have been books written. The most famous one was called How to Avoid Probate back in the 60s. Um, there was a big lawsuit that this was the practice of law. 
they lost. It's not the practice of law. It's a book that gives people guidance on how to handle their own estates, right? You've heard of, you may have heard of Nolo Press. Um, they, they've been around for years and years uh, with legal form software and books that help people with family law matters, um, child custody, promissory notes, living trusts. You can see the examples out there. And probably the most famous of all of automated or uh, uh, document automation in law is TurboTax um, and the many other uh, copycats that came along after them, right? You're essentially filling out a form, answering questions, and it's branching based on your answers. Do you have children? Tell me about them. You don't have children. You know, do you own a business? Do you own your own home? So on and so forth. And out comes the legal form of the 1040, your tax form, right? So in 2005, we launched something. We, we wrote a piece of software called A to J Author. And the design, this is actually the later version of it, but the design of it was very explicit. It was a clean screen. It was a little, uh, a little box of text. When the lawyers who write these guided interviews wanted to put more text, we said, no, you gotta have, a, you gotta have multiple screens because uh, there were some design goals that we were trying to follow. And I'll talk about that in a second. Of course, it also runs on mobile. So behind A to J author is a decision tree, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ordering of the questions that branch based on the answers that the person is giving. This is just one example. It's a blow up of the one you saw from a previous slide. Um, and so each one of these boxes represents a question. And sometimes the question might be, how much money do you make? Which is not a simple question, by the way. And how much money do you make? And if you make too much, then it, then it goes one way. If you make enough or not enough or whatever the criteria might be, it goes another way. It changes the questions that the, the person's gonna be asked based on their responses, all right? So that's how doc assembly in a broad sense works, right? There's some sort of software that's on your phone or on a computer, the end user, gets to the software. And, and by the way, that's a big issue is gets to the software. How do they know that it exists? Uh, hopefully they typed it into Google and it appeared on the first page. Hopefully they saw a brochure or hopefully the court or the legal aid organization points to it. That's how they find it. So they find that information. They start filling it out. The data gets collected and sent to a server. The data is just the name, address, city, state, zip, all the little boxes. And then the form, which is in the courts, the court is designed to form, then get electronically melded or mail merged or put together and out comes a PDF or a Word file that the person can theoretically download, sign, and then you know, download, print, and sign, and submit to the court. Or in an increasing number of courts, just press a button, and the data just skips the form part and becomes an electronic filing. Although it's taken years for even a few courts to get to that point. So the little boxes that you see on the screen are actually little tables of information within the software. Simple, right? Straightforward. Um, the collection of answers from the user are stored in an ANX file, at least an A to J author. ANX is just a made up file format. It's an XML file um, that refer to, you know, that, that, that get passed to the server and formatted in a way that the software can then do the mail merge with, right? Now, of course, it's not an actual server, it's off in the cloud. Um, you know, this is an oversimplification of it, but I hope it gives you the basic idea. So the design goals of A to J Author was that we wanted to make it as easy to use as possible for self-represented litigants. And our interviews with SRLs was that generally they're less familiar with computers than your typical law student or typical uh, executive director of a nonprofit. Um, English might be their second language, big issue, right? Legalese is a huge issue in these forms. So we want our stuff to be at fifth or sixth grade level of explaining legal topics. They might only have a high school education or less. Um, and uh, as you saw from the, from the Rebecca Sandifer study, they're stressed out, right? They're having to deal with their own legal problem. They can't afford a lawyer. So of course they have anxiety about it. Um, another design goal for us to do this was we wanted to be able to scale this up by having lots of lawyers be able to automate lots of forms. So in other words, we wanted to be able to train an attorney how to, how to create the, their own guided interviews 
um, in a couple of hours without them having to learn to be a full-blown programmer. That was going to be too hard and too expensive. And I believe we succeeded at that. Actually, we did. So I told myself I was going to put a couple of breaks in here. This is a Zoom virtual background interlude. So take a breath and step back. If you, uh, uh, I love playing around with uh, Zoom backgrounds. This one is, um, this one is Chonk. Looks like I can't get it to play, but Chonk will sit there and chew on his broccoli and um, and uh, be in your Zoom background. If you want a copy of this uh, Zoom background, then uh, just email me at uh, jmayer at uh, kelly.org. All right? All right, end of our little break. So where were we? We were talking about A to J author. So here's A to J author, lots of, a, a very clean screen, um, an avatar to guide you. Uh, the user is represented by his own avatar or her own avatar, or their own avatar. Um, which isn't doesn't appear in this screen. Um, AHA author is used in 45 different states and in countries outside the United States. To date, it's been used, it's been run over 7 million times by self-represented litigants. I call that success. Um, it's open source software. It's free for legal aid and courts to use to automate their own forms. We provide that support with funding by both Cali and by Legal Services Corporation. And here are some of the things we learned in doing this and, ha and have been doing this for 15 years, that the legal process is also a legal education opportunity. In other words, people, while going through this, are learning a little bit more about the law and about their situation. And so it's an opportunity to drop in some things to teach them. And so we have a little pop-up boxes that the author can put in there that explain, well, why are you asking for my social security number? Why is my income include um, veterans benefits and other things? Um, another thing we learned was that not to waste users time. And the way you do that is if there are disqualifying questions in the form, you know, and they're, uh, they're at, the, at the end of the form, you know, the bottom of the page, then in the interview, they should be at the front. So in other words, the first couple of questions should be, are you here doing the right thing you know, for the right reasons. And if you aren't, then it can shuttle you off to the right place or off to some other web page where you can learn more about your problem. Um, the, the, one of the things we observed in our study was people would get to the end of a long process of filling out a form and find out that they didn't qualify or that they were filling out the wrong form or some horrible detail that would, that would be extremely frustrating to them. So we don't want to waste user time. We want to front load. We want to rearrange the questions in the form because we can do that now, right? We're redesigning the interview process so that if they're in the wrong place, they're, 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 they're quickly gotten out of there. The, set, the other thing we learned is that slow is equal to fast. And that sounds weird. But what it means is that we pluck each question out and put it on its own screen. And so it seems like it slows things down because it's like, you know, name, next screen, address, next screen, city, state, zip, so on and so forth. But what happened in our studies was people would look at the entirety of a form and they would feel overwhelmed. It was like this wall of text sort of problem. But when we dropped it into a guided interview where they were only asked one thing, focus on this right now. You know, they were able to answer it quickly in a less stressful situation, and they were able to actually move faster. It's like the difference between like shoving the whole candy bar in your mouth or M&Ms, I guess. You know what I mean? One, one, bit, one bite at a time. Last thing we learned was when we showed this to tech savvy people, they hated it. They're like, this is coddling. This is going too slow. You know, but when we showed it to SRL, self-represented litigants, real ones, um, they were like, I like that. It goes at the speed I can understand. And so we have to be careful about who is giving you uh, advice on your user interface because smart people are different than sometimes your target audiences. All right. So lots of forms have been automated with data G author. This is the New York courts, family court forms. They've automated about 40 forms. You can get an uncontested divorce. You can change your custody visitations. Um, um, and that gets used uh, 40 or 50,000 times a month. Um, 
they the reason why I point them out is they do a survey at the end of every one of their forms, and they've collected tens of thousands of comments about their forms and about A to J author. And fortunately, they say wonderful things like this. This is helpful during this difficult time emotionally and financially. Notice emotionally, people are in, have anxiety about doing this. Very user-friendly and worth using. Court forms can be very confusing and hard to fill out by yourself. Thank you for having this program to help. All forms should have a DIY form program option. It saves a lot of time and there are no errors. It also saves a second trip to the court. See, that's, I mean, these, the, the comments that we got from this are exactly to the design goals we were, we were going for. So we knew we were doing the right thing. So what about that question that I started this presentation with? Cali, why is Cali a legal education operation doing access to justice? And the answer is we use this software also as a training tool in law schools. In other words, if, 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 it's, if it's the future of law practice, and we believe it is, we believe that lawyers in the future, actually right now in the present, but more so in the future, will be automating their own practices. In other words, they will automate the simple stuff, the form filling out, so that they have more time for the things that can't be automated or are more difficult to be automated or require an empathic person or require uh, human interaction. So law students doing their own little A to J author projects or learning about A to J author like you are today right now uh, can learn by automating the law. Now, there's a flip side to that. Law students are the worst people to automate a court form because they have no experience in doing that. The best people are legal aid attorneys who understand the audience and have practiced in that area and that jurisdiction for a, for a period of time. But that doesn't mean that law students can't work with or mentor with court staff or legal aid attorneys to do the same thing. I mentioned the 21st century law practice skill. I, I, think, I think, I mean, even if you don't use A to J author, um, and it's not a commercial product. It's a free product for nonprofits or courts or legal aids to use. But there are tons of commercial products out there. You will be automating or using an automated tools in your, in your practice. Now, if you do do a project that works with uh, the local court or with legal aid, well, then that would help to address the uh, access to justice gap. And that little star needs some explanation was me referring to the fact that law students can't do this by themselves. They would have to partner up with somebody with uh, that skill, um, to use another acronym, an SME, somebody with subject matter expertise. And finally, I think this is a tech competency thing, right? There's, there's things that every lawyer should know about and, the, and document automation is definitely one of them, even before you graduate from law school. So that's how, so, so we've been using A to J author, we built A to J author to solve an access to justice problem, but we also use it to train the future cohorts of lawyers in this document assembly world. So we've given, I've given presentations like this at lots of schools, um, an awful lot over Zoom like this. Um, and uh, some schools, it's just a presentation. At other schools, it's a project for the students. At other schools, there's, there's even more going on. Um, and we're, we have stuff on the website at www.a2jauthor.org to help you learn about age author. There's a ton of videos up on our YouTube channel, you know, you know, big overviews and very, you know, intricate individual um, feature uh, videos as well. So that's why I think this is important. It's about tech competency for law students who will eventually become lawyers in the 21st century. So we've been doing this since 2005. It's time for another really quick break. These are uh, Woodcocks. If the if I could get the video to work, why can't I get the video to work? All right, can't get the video to work. But anyhow, these guys do their do a little dance, and when they do their little dance, the chicks behind them are practicing what mom is doing. It's just uh, cute as all heck. If you would want a copy of this background, it's a video background. Uh, email me, jmayer at kelly.org. All right, we're getting close to finishing up. So I just talked to you about Cali's project, A to J Author, which has been around for 15 years. We're the biggest legal aid open source project out there. We've been used over 7 million times um, and we're still going strong. 
But there are a lot of other tools that are available that you may or may not have heard about. And I just want to do a very quick sort of skim through some of them. There's a, a big company out of Germany called Brighter. And, and these are some of the uh, advertisements I pulled from their website, um, Decisions Automated. And you can see, even in the graphic here, it looks like a decision tree, right? Um, 650 is an operation that got started at Brigham Young Law School. And now actually they're part of a law firm. I'm gonna forget, Wilson Sonsini, there it is. Um, and you can see some of the things that they've automated. GDPR and CCPA compliance, uh, diversity and inclusion, um, here are some of their pro bono services, uh, uh, an, an automated form for generating a letter to your landlord, an automated form to lenders. Um, they were doing a checklist for return to worship after COVID. And um, I can't see the other one because my, my face is in the way. Oh yeah, um, some automation of forms for, uh, for asylum, all right? Hello Divorce is a, is a, is a startup. Um, they started in California as a way to assist people to do their own divorces. And so there's some document automation in there. There's also some website support. And if you go to the website, you'll see that they have behind their stuff is a, is a big flow chart of, of a decision tree of, of, how, of how their operation is doing. They're turning themselves into a franchise and taking the same model and copying it in with proper adjustments for the law in, in new states all the time. I think they're in two or three states now. Um, they have something that's like sits on top of the document assembly called a divorce navigator. In other words, it walks you through the steps in which individual steps might involve uh, filling out forms or going to court or, or some other activity. Upsolve is another nonprofit that's all about federal bankruptcies, and they've automated the forms for bankruptcy for, for people who can't afford, you know, they're so poor, they can't even afford a lawyer to declare bankruptcy and to uh, discharge debt. Um, after pattern is, now, no, 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 Hello Divorce and Upsolve are verticals. They're around, they're, they're in a very specific legal area. So Upsolve in bankruptcy, Hello Divorce and Divorces. Um, and there are also companies out there that are more what I call horizontals. In other words, they have tools that you can use to build, automate any type of form or law. And that, and A to J sort of fits that pattern, right? We're, 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 a, we're, a, ver, we're a horizontal. Right. After Pattern is a company where you can build forms, spreadsheets, um, all, all kinds of things. Um, and I believe they have a, a good deal for uh, nonprofits and legal aids, maybe even free. I'm not exactly sure of that. So check the website to be sure of that. Um, DocAssemble is, a, is, a, is an open source package of tools written in Python and YAML and Markdown that you can use to build your own. So if you are a, a nerd or if you are very techie um, and know Python or want to, learn a pro, want to learn to be more of a programmer, there are software tools out there like DocAssemble. E to J Author is also open source. It's written in JavaScript though. So it's a, it's a bit of a lift to expect a, a non-programmer to be able to uh, jump in and, 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 and mess around that. Uh, of course, the most famous or biggest Document automation company out there is LegalZoom. They use, they give away cheaper, relatively inexpensive document automation up front. But their goal is to use that as a funnel to find people who can afford lawyers and to then get a referral or refer them to a lawyer. Um, so they're 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 putting document automation as part of a larger, uh, different business plan, you might say. All right, Neoda is another horizontal. They do intelligent document automation and process automation. Um, generally work with uh, uh, law firms on, on this sort of thing. So, you know, uh, you go in to work, you know, if you want to automate like an entire practice area or something like that, um, they have some great tools as well. There's smaller firms and startups like LawDroid that does chatbots, uh, Document that does other document automation. Um, you know, there's literally dozens of these kind of firms that are out there. So that's why I think this is the future of law practice. There's a lot going on, a lot of innovation. There's free and cheap ways to do this. And, and, and I think you're going to be a more competitive lawyer and a more efficient lawyer. And for that matter, I think a better practicing lawyer, because if you can automate away the boring or the easy or the, or the uh, uh, repetitive, repetitive stuff, 
then you have more time for the empathic, more time for the interpersonal, more time for the higher thinking uh, types of practice. And, and originally with this slide, I said that the pandemic has accelerated a lot of this. The pandemic has rapidly changed the justice system. A lot of courts said, wow, I wish we had more automated forms because we can't get people coming into court for live court during a pandemic. Um, and a lot of law firms said, we need to explore this because this changes the way we practice practice law. I think now with the pandemic, you know, slowly uh, going away, you know, it's not about the pandemic anymore. It's it's people's eyes have been open to the idea that document automation, which has been around for 40 years, by the way, literally 40 years. Uh, Cali had a document automation project back in 1985. Um, um, it's not about the pandemic or about that. It's about the, finally the future coming home to roost in the justice system, in the law practice system. So that's my talk. Thank you very much for listening to me. If you wanted those uh, Zoom interlude backgrounds, I'm sorry that the video didn't play. Um, email me at jmayer at cali.org. Um, I'm happy to take any questions or answer any questions about uh, Cali or about A to J author if you, if you want. Um, thank you very much and take care.